Over the summer, we put on five workshops, four in Oklahoma and two in New Mexico, that allowed an opportunity for tribes to network with each other and with the new institutions of the Climate Science Center and the Land Conservation Cooperatives to talk about climate and be introduced to some tools that are readily available to the public through these agencies and to find ways that they could utilize these tools for themselves as well as at the same time talk about climate change and the stories of their place in their own words specific to their locations. We had four in Oklahoma, one was in uh, Stillwater, Oklahoma that invited 10 of the tribes up in that region and then the second was down in Fort Cobb the third was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The fourth was in uh, Wyandotte, Oklahoma. And the final one was down in the Chickasaw Cultural Center down in um, Sulphur, Oklahoma. The reason that I think that's important is because it takes to them this information. Instead of asking tribes to come to the, these agencies, it, it takes the agencies more to their locations and has an opportunity, it offers opportunity for the stories of that place to be told and to be heard in, in a way that is unique to them and, and their region. I think when we step back and look at uh, those people who have a close relationship with the environment, uh, the tribes uh, lead that, that category. Uh, that's something that without the tribes, uh, we're not going to be able to address. We're not going to be able to get at that, that challenge. Uh, I think the cultural richness in terms of they've been here a, a long time and they've been close to the land uh, a long time. There are tribes that have been here for a very long time in the South Central region generally. Uh, there are tribes, as we know, uh, that, have, that were moved here. Uh, but they came here with knowledge about where they had been. Um, what the tribes are bringing to the table are very specific needs that they have for information and also a, an understanding of really what is changing in the climate where they live. Um, so I can, I can throw out a weather station somewhere and it's going to give me some data but the depth of the information, what is really changing in the community because our climate is shifting, has to come from the people who are living in those communities. And how those changes spatially are different. So what happens in um, New Mexico or certain parts of New Mexico with specific tribes who might be um, dealing with uh, mountainous terrain as opposed to some who are on uh, more Mesa uh, geographies, that depth of information is really important to us as climate scientists because we don't know how to talk to people about adaptation uh, unless we better understand what the problems are. You know, climate change is kind of complex. Of, I mean, you've got climate change and you've got global warming, and there's a relationship there, but you know, I think that climate change is um, is you know is, is more broad and you know, I look at it as really a, you know an increasing extremes in in weather in, you know increasing variability in in weather and you know again it's tied into global warming but um, you know it's it, it, I think it means different things for different areas for different people so you know it's it's complex. Climate change is a, a part of a new adaption for all of our peoples, uh, not just the Ponca people, but around the globe. For instance, a good friend of mine named Faith Gimmel, who's uh, an Arctic Circle native, that her people there are learning to plant for the first time ever in their culture, ever in their culture, because the permafrost has melted. So they're hunting, they're berry picking, their seasonal activities that would take them through the winter doesn't happen anymore. So among the Ponca people, the same situation and different is happening. Because of the drought situation, because of the situation of these massive rains occasionally happening, because of the past drought that has happened, and the global warming that is going on as a result of this. 
we know that within the last 10 years since the century turned that uh, 10 of the 12 years there's been warmer area than ever before we can't dig in the ground there is no such thing as a root cellar anymore the, the berries that we used to pick, uh, the drought has killed them. The trees that were there, about one in every eight trees has died. Our fruit trees aren't producing at the same rate as they were before. The ponds have completely dried up in areas where people used to go fish and know that they could have food. For a lot of our Kawa people, um, like one of our waterways that we monitor um, every uh, month is Jimmy Creek. And Jimmy Creek now for the past two summers has dried up. And we have never seen it before since most of our creeks we monitor are aquifer fed. So that goes to show that the water levels not just on the surface waters are depleting, but the waters in the aquifers are starting to deplete also. And it's not any rain to quote recharge those aquifers to give us our water. The, the biggest concern to the Chittimacha people um, is is closest related weather-wise to hurricane uh, damage and um, because we have seen such um, shoreline erosion and subsidence coastally and we are coastal people that um, those protections the the buffer that we used to have is is getting less and less um, and so the concern would be that the storm surge and hurricanes would would be more impactful to to our reservation lands. Um, climate change has meant to us is that um, uh, last year with one of the larger fires in western United States, uh, the Lost Conscious Fire, we we're irrigating our fields with black water and that comes from soot because the mountains that are on fire are the mountains where our headwaters come from. So that's the water we use for life um, and our agriculture. Um, so it's a very important uh, place to us and it's very important obviously because of the, the use of water. So that climate change means that our um, forests are um, very vulnerable to uh, wildfires and now we've seen two major fires this year. On the Navajo Reservation, um, I remember it being a lot greener and the Arizona region plateau, Colorado plateau has been experiencing one of the most uh, longest droughts in history and so one of the things that happens is without water with high wind which is what we deal with a lot there um, sand dunes are forming at an alarming rate so in my lifetime I've seen a lot of the Indian reservation I live on turn into sand dunes and also being raised by my grandmother who's no longer with us she was an herbalist and she would take us out and show us the different plants for medicinal reasons. And um, I take my six-year-old son around and we don't see those plants anymore. So a very different environment just for my son, one generation down, is a reason, is what I think climate change is, is seeing our environment change within one generation. The extreme in, in, in climate really impacted agriculture. Well, first, the uh, the really hot weather pretty much eliminated the maple syrup harvest last year and you know in, um, in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan. You know I guess I kind of look at it through through food and you know or that's one of the big lenses that I look at it through. And with the wild rice when you had all that rain it wiped out pretty much completely wiped out the wild rice beds from eastern Minnesota all the way across Wisconsin. And you know that's a big that's a big impact on you know on people's you know on people's lives and you know being able to 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 harvest a, you know really a a food product that still sustains you know people's diets to a very large degree. The most noticeable impact to to the to the pueblo has been um, realized through through drought and the conditions that are related to drought, uh, what it does to the landscape what it does to vegetation, um, the concerns that come from not being able to find plant life or animal life that are, that are port important to cultural identity, cultural practices, and how those drought conditions uh, hurt the operations of our, of our ranch, um, hunting operations, and the natural habitat. With drought comes the issues of overgrazing. 
comes the issues of um, invasive species that, uh, that come in from the overgrazing. And trying to find ways of uh, delivering water, nutrients, that type of thing to cattle over 74,000 acres, or it, be it becomes a challenge. Here, where we are, we're in the, the corner of the four state area, so Missouri, Arkansas, Kansas, and Oklahoma. Um, it seems that we have difficulty anymore having what, what I would consider the spring fruits. Um, it will turn off very, very warm early uh, in February, which used to be winter, very cold, very low temperatures, but now it will we'll have so many warm days in February or March that it will, all of the, the fruit trees, many of the plants will begin to blossom and begin to bear fruit and then suddenly we'll have a hard freeze and it will destroy or damage a very high percentage of that. And in Neosho, which is only about 15 miles from here, they actually had five inches of snow accumulate the first week of May this year. Unheard of, yes. And, and we have those anomalies, it seems, more and more often. I took a little tour of the, through the Chickasaw National Recreation Area in 2011, and I saw that the streams had quit flowing, and there used to be a lot of uh, swimming holes there that the kids used to swim in, and they had hazardous signs uh, posted that, that kept the public out of those swimming holes because the water was stagnant, not flowing anymore. And then I did a little research on uh, the flows on the Blue River, and in 2011 the, the flow rate on the Blue River dropped down to about one cubic foot per second, which is the lowest flow rate it had been since the 1950s. And then we've seen an outgrowth of uh, blue-green algae in some of our lakes, uh, which is spurred on by the, by the dry conditions and the high temperatures. As soon as May hits, I'm, you know, ready to go. Because I'm in a rural area, we don't have sirens, we don't have, um, you know, anything like that. When the weather alerts come on TV, our satellite goes out because of, you know, the rain or hail. So I'm basically using my cell phone. And if I'm not using my cell phone, I have to kind of listen and feel the wind if there's an updraft or if there's an inflow or something. Um, kind of like a weather nerd now. So, <laughs> and um, Where I grew up in uh, close to the Red River bottoms in Oklahoma, uh, always very fertile ground for growing uh, any number of crops. Well, here recently, over the past few years, they've started a large-scale uh, irrigation project because the lands seem to be deprived of, of, of water that was always there. So now they're bringing in more water and uh, kind of revitalize the land, and, and the crops have uh, certainly picked up due to that. But before, here recently, that never was needed. These are things I attribute to climate change, which um, affects the local economy and and a uh, affects the sociology and, and, um, and people's jobs, so it definitely affects uh, the tribal people. Everything has drastically changed and we believe that that's going to continue to change. So we're doing a lot of adapting of how, if we need to, how are we going to exist off the grid, you know. As a mother, as a member of the Navajo Nation, it concerns me. I think it concerns a lot of people. But it's being able to say, okay, what do we do about it now, you know. Um, in the institute I oversee, one of the programs we also run is Climate Change and a, a Tribal Clean Energy Resource Center. And it looks at sustainable energy solutions and helping tribes to say, okay, in 50 years, 20 years, how can we start transitioning in, in some cleaner energy sources so you're not so dependent on whatever fossil fuel source you have. 
Um, so climate change means that there's um, a process where the environment and the natural resources landscapes are changing, uh, which means we as human who live on that same landscape, we have to change also. So we've been in the process of uh, uh, Im uh, implementing adaptation uh, strategies in our farming. So this year, uh, my sons and I, we are farming on a third less of the land and hopefully using less than a third of the water. And we're hoping to achieve getting the same yield from our uh, smaller um, land use and water use area. We've partnered with our uh, sister tribe, the Chickasaw Nation, and we're developing a water plan. And this focuses on, on long-term sustainability of water resources in the Choctaw and Chickasaw Nations. Uh, climate change has partly uh, expanded our thinking to how we plan for the future and how we can become more efficient and uh, better stewards of water in, in, uh, in our region here in Oklahoma. Part of our water planning efforts is to uh, come up with uh, ways to deal with drought conditions. You know, there's, uh, you can do artificial aquifer recharge and try to take the waters during storm events and replenish the water in the aquifer during those storm events to uh, have a build up your water supply for for drought conditions. Uh, we're also looking at we're doing a study on uh, recycling and reuse of, of wastewater which typically is just discharged to a stream and then flows down to the Red River and out to the Gulf. Um, in our planning meetings that we have with other tribes uh, that are planning meetings that uh, through, through EPA we've had opportunities to to look at some of these problems and and see that uh, we're not alone other tribes are finding these same concerns and and while that may not lead to policy changes uh, in the immediate in the immediate future uh, it helps to at least identify those problems and and uh, and give them uh, examples that that people can point to and, and say this is an example of, of what we're seeing and and being able to understand that we're not alone in these concerns. So continuing to have these networks and, and building these relationships, um, there are some situations where uh, relationships of trust just aren't there. Uh, there are tribal communities that are hesitant to trust government agencies and, and for good reason. But through these kinds of efforts and, and through efforts to try and reach out um, maybe we can start to build again if we're able to find these common needs uh, behind cult, uh, climate change. And um, it may turn out that climate change might be the thing that, that brings us closer together um, because it's going to become such a, uh, a pressing need. When I talk to folks about climate change or any of their environmental issues is be educated enough to make your own decision. And that means learning everything you need to learn about the subject and then having then taking your own cultural side and incorporating that and saying what's best for us and then building a plan you know there's nothing stronger to me that means sovereignty is for them to have their own plan and incorporate it um, and that takes education that takes political will money all those things along the way, but it first starts with you knowing what you want. Climate change, climate variability and change, that's not going to be solved in a month or, or 10 years. This is something that we are going to be living with forever. It's not going to go away. Uh, carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas, that is being increased in the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels, stays in the atmosphere a long time. So what we are started on here is a very, very long journey, and we need to be in for the long haul. So this responsibility is here, now, and will be in the future. These dialogues will continue. You know, there's opportunities for these people to continue talking amongst each other across cultures, across disciplines, across landscapes. Respecting that in the conversation of, of science in the conversation of climate change 
is critical because our worldview might offer some new ideas that maybe science hasn't considered or they've overlooked or dismissed. There's been a lot of dismiss and we've been here for thousands of years and we've survived this long. There's something we're doing right. And these opportunities to continue these dialogues is critical, not just for us, but for humans, you know, all of us, all of us on this blue green planet called Earth. You know, these, these are our relatives. These are not our resources. We need to have relationships that are such. Thank you.